Good morning, and thank you for joining us today to discuss Ontario's position in developing a national strategy to address long-term care. My name is Alex from the Ministry of Health, and I'm joined by my colleagues Hong Yu from Long-Term Care, Megan from Intergovernmental Affairs, and Ismail from Finance. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that the University of Toronto and the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy sit on the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat, Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Today, we are, our purpose is to present a strategy to partner with the federal government and other provinces and territories to address the crisis in our long-term care system. Ontario's goal is to work with the federal government to stabilize the current system so it will be capable of responding to the current and coming demand. But beyond that, we propose a long-term strategy to engage our Canadian partners in a bold transformation of the system, which includes the introduction of a social insurance scheme for long-term care. To develop this transformation, we must keep in mind Ontario's key objectives throughout the negotiation process. Ontario is committed to better outcomes for patients that are sustainable through stabilizing the current system and transforming it for the long term to meet future demand. Ontario is also committed to developing a sustainably sourced and diverse long term care system that has sufficient funding and adequate resources. This includes human resources and infrastructure. And of course, Ontario wants to secure funding from the federal government with a strategy that has federal support and full engagement by the other provinces and territories. An effective strategy is one that meets Ontario's goals and does not require any explicit penalties for non-compliance. Now to move forward into finding the problem. Long-term care in Canada and Ontario has historically been inadequately staffed, inefficiently regulated, and suffers from poor and aging infrastructure. These underlying problems have been exacerbated by the effects of COVID-19 with the disproportionate effects this pandemic has had on long-term care residents. But even without the pandemic, Ontario was in a crisis due to the lack of space, lack of innovation, and lack of sustainable financing to serve the needs of the population. Now Hong Yu will drill down further on the problem. Thank you, Alex. The mismanagement of long-term care in Ontario and Canada has had tragic consequences for the residents in the facilities and their families, with more than 3,700 people losing their lives in long-term care homes. These deaths were avoidable. Other countries have managed their long-term care homes better, and within Canada, other provinces have mitigated the impacts of COVID more effectively. Put simply, the system failed. It failed the residents, and it failed their families who relied on long-term care homes to keep them safe. But this system did not fail overnight. It has been under increasing pressure for the past few decades, and the situation will only get worse without real reform. We are all aware of the coming silver tsunami, which will swamp a healthcare system that was designed when the population was young and few Canadians had to rely on assisted living. Now, an aging population has to rely on facilities built 40 years ago, which struggle to meet current needs. Already, there are close to 40,000 people on wait lists who wait a median time of 161 days with some people waiting years to get a spot in a long-term care home. Long-term care facilities also find it difficult to attract and retain talent as employees leave a sector where they are underpaid and overworked. The filling system in turn puts increasing pressure on unpaid caregivers, which is unsustainable for families as the population ages and family sizes shrink. Unpaid care work also has economic costs as caregivers withdraw from the labour market or are unable to participate fully. The root cause of the filling long-term care system is its unsustainable funding model. Long-term care funding in Canada is highly dependent on general revenue, which is unreliable because it is often captured by general health care spending or subject to other priorities or the political issue of the day. For Ontario, to the extent it relies on transfers under the Canada Health Act, depending on general revenue makes it subject to federal priorities. Canada's peers rely more on social insurance contributions, which are more sustainable and can support more diverse healthcare options. For example, in Germany, which is close to 60% of funds from social insurance, from its social insurance scheme, two thirds of those needing long-term care services are able to receive care at home. As Ontario's healthcare spending is projected to grow substantially over the next few years and decades, long-term care homes need a dedicated and sustainable source of funding. 
In particular, long-term care costs are projected to explode over the next few decades to more than triple from its current 22 billion to 71 billion by 2050. If nothing is changed under current funding models, just maintaining current care levels will require deficits and or taxes to rise significantly. If action isn't taken, long-term care costs will swallow an increasing portion of the budget, putting the entire system under greater strain. Ontario is willing and has made significant investments to improve long-term care. You know, it has made uh, investments to address infrastructure and staffing shortages, which will represent significant increases from the expenditures that were committed, uh, that have been committed so far. Given that long-term care spending in 2019 from Ontario was $4 billion, these new commitments put substantial strain on Ontario's budget. But it is working to implement, for example, the recommendations from the Long-Term Care Working Group, which completed its work last year in June. However, these investments are simply insufficient to deal with the democratic, demographic and financial pressures that Ontario will face in the medium to long term. Our new plan is to transform the system and establish new sources of funding. I'll now turn over to Megan, who will explain our vision and plan. Thanks, Hong Yu. As Hong Yu mentioned, the current issues we are seeing through this pandemic have actually been long festering in the system. With the public outcry and call for national standards, Canada has a unique opportunity right now, not just to stabilize the system, but to also establish a long overdue transformation. Our vision for a long-term care system is one that is sustainably financed, diverse and dynamic, and has strong frameworks for oversight. We need a system that ensures that individuals can save for care, and we want a system that does not have to rely on debt financing. Care is also so much more than just long-term care homes. Currently, the system is skewed towards institutional care. This has resulted in the large pressures we are witnessing today on these homes. In fact, it has been found that around one in nine residents in long-term care homes would actually benefit better from home care. We should be offering individuals choice of care according to their needs. The current tragedy has also emphasized the need for greater enforcement. Care homes should not be left to neglect. We should ensure they are places of comfort for seniors to age well. Ultimately, what we want is to shift the culture of care away from its current focus on compliance. We want an outcomes-based approach. We want a culture that places primacy on the quality of life. So we've looked into a number of approaches and come up with three possible options. First, to increase the Canada health transfer to 35%. Second, we could establish individual bilateral agreements. And our third and recommended option is to increase the Canada health transfer instead to 30%, but with this introduce a social insurance scheme for care. As you can see, the first two options are a funding solution. They involve the provinces going to the federal government for money which would be the most natural course of action, especially the, given the current state of the province's finances. However, the fiscal impact of this will require the federal government to resort to debt financing or tax increases. What we really want for the long term is a revenue solution. From a purely provincial standpoint, the option to increase the Canada health transfer with no additional conditions would be ideal. Premiers have long called for the transfer to be increased to meet the growing healthcare demands of the population. And this pandemic is just an example of that. From a federal standpoint, bilateral agreements would be the preferred approach. There is a lot of precedent for this and the federal government would be able to tie funding to specific long-term care conditions. However, both options would have resistance on either side. Through the transfers, funding for care would be fungible and will have to compete with physicians and institutions in the budget. On the other hand, bilateral agreements are time limited, which do not give the provinces the security they need. A bilateral approach also does not meet the public demand for national standards. In order to really solve the root cause of this problem, we need to establish a system that has buy-in from both the federal government and the provinces and territories. To justify this to Canadians, we need to create a better system. We need a system that drives better outcomes and is sustainably funded. Our recommendation, therefore, is twofold to modestly increase the Canada health transfer to 30% of healthcare expenditures, which will bring immediate relief to long-term care systems and establish a social insurance program, which we have called the Age Well Insurance Plan or AWIP. This insurance plan would first involve federal, provincial and territorial agreement to a pan-Canadian framework. It will outline objectives for care and shared priorities while allowing provinces to set their own outcomes and maintain jurisdiction over long-term care. AWIP would provide a sustainable source of funding for care. In the long run, it will not rely on transfers, 
but will generate capacity for investment. It would also promote a diverse marketplace of care as individuals can choose the best form according to their specific needs. The initial increase in the Canada Health Transfer would bring the provinces and territories on board and the insurance plan provides the federal government something they can go back to the public with confidence about bringing real change to the care system. As you can see, the first two options focus on getting more funding for the short term, but this doesn't achieve our vision for a sustainable dynamic system of care with strong oversight and accountability. Our recommendation today for a modest increase to the Canada Health Transfer to stabilize the system in the short term and the establishment of a social insurance program for care not only achieves that vision, but also strikes the right balance between having both provincial and federal support. We know that this approach is bold, but transformational change to our care system is long overdue. The insurance program will modernize care for all Canadians. Now I will pass it on to my colleague Ismail, who will discuss this further in detail. Thank you, Megan. So in terms of how the long-term care insurance plan would work, Canadians and employers will contribute a combined annual three percentage points of personal income into the fund. Those three percentage points are estimated to be worth $18 billion in, in additional annual funding dedicated to long-term care. On top of these contributions, we propose that the federal government transfers the equivalent of a one tax percentage point of personal income into the fund. We believe that this transfer will alleviate the pressure on the private sector and ensure healthcare spending related to long-term care is preserved and effectively allocated. The fund will be managed federally by the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board, resembling the way the Canada Pension Plan works. The fund cash flows will ensure that the rising costs of the aging population are covered in a sustainable manner in the future. Provincial ministries of health will set eligibility criteria for providers and clients and administer and enforce standards in long-term care facilities. Once our seniors feel they require regular support in their daily activities, they will be able to tap into the earned entitlements available to them through the fund. Disbursements will go towards reducing wait lists, subsidizing co-payments, funding new assistive technologies and innovations, and expanding home-based care. Importantly, disbursements will be guided by a strategy of prevention and innovation in which seniors are encouraged to age in place and seek services and activities that reduce their risk of institutionalization. These investments will also be guided by pan-Canadian pan standards and so will aim to achieve adequate capacity and compensation levels for all long-term care staff to enable them to provide the necessary level of quality care. In the end, we believe that the new financing system will create a holistic care continuum delivered by a vibrant, diverse, and dynamic long-term care market that is geared towards prevention, innovation, and quality. This slide summarizes the total investments needed over the coming five years to realize this ambitious strategy. Our total projected costs can be broken down into two main categories. In the first category, project having to invest around $8.6 billion to stabilize our system and cover operating and staffing costs until the new financing scheme kicks in. Recognizing the fiscal burden the federal government has been accumulating, we propose that these costs be evenly split between the province and the federal government. In the second category, we envision the federal government funding the insurance plan gradually to a total of $6.6 .6 billion by 2025. Beyond those five years, the federal government would continue contributing to the fund at an annual one percentage point prescribed. This would bring the total contribution by the federal government to around $11 billion in the coming five years. There's no doubt that these are big numbers and that there will be increased costs for employers, the government and citizens. But what we're talking about here is a new deal for Canadians. We will make real commitments and fulfill real outcomes that will enable us to fundamentally transform our seniors' experiences, level of comfort and quality of life in Canada, no matter where they choose to be cared for. These commitments will inform our pan-Canadian framework and show the government and Canadians the progress we, have made, uh, we will make and have made in the past. Although our framework does not have prescriptive regulations, it is expected that each province will develop its own set of outcomes to ensure that long-term care systems meet the objectives of this overarching framework. In Ontario, we will hold ourselves accountable to delivering real outcomes in terms of safety, real outcomes in terms of care, and real outcomes that protect and improve the lives of Canadians. This slide shows the phasing of our strategy in three distinct stages, 
in the immediate and medium term effort, uh, in the immediate and medium terms, efforts will be focused on investing the money coming from the Canada Health Transfer into bringing our existing long-term care infrastructure up to the standards Canadians should expect from us. In this phase, we also expect the federal government to start gradually contributing tax transfers into the fund to build it up prior to its introduction to the public. Once we get past 2025, AWIP will take over as the main long-term care financing scheme. The federal government will contribute a constant annual one percentage point into the fund and employees and employers will gradually increase their contribution from a combined one percentage point to three percentage points. I will now pass it on to Alex to discuss risks and, the commu and our communication plan. Thanks so much, Ismail. What I'd like to highlight now are what we see as the mitigation strategies for the most important risks that we've identified. We risk that the pan-Canadian framework may result in overregulation, that other provinces may push back on the implementation of the AWIP program, and most importantly, we risk having potential adverse economic impact to employees and employers. The risk of potential overregulation is mitigated by the fact that this is an outcomes-based strategy. The risk of provincial pushback over AWIP implementation is mitigated by the fact that the social insurance model has clear systemic benefits and we have time to work with the provinces following the initial increases to the Canada Health Transfer. But most significantly, the major risk is the potential for adverse economic impact that this could have on the economy's growth, as we recognize that this proposal does not come with a small price tag. However, we do mitigate this risk by proposing a phased rollout and we will work extremely closely with our businesses to support them throughout this change. We will craft unique messaging to communicate with our government partners and to the public. The key message to the federal government is that the social insurance plan is a responsible and sustainable revenue solution that truly supports Canadians' needs. The key messaging to the other provinces and territories is that this system maintains jurisdictional autonomy as it is an outcomes-based approach. And lastly, to the public, we will communicate that Ontario hears them and hears their concerns about long-term care. We will focus our messaging on the fact that the immediate stabilization efforts, coupled with the age well insurance plan, allow the population to age with the dignity that they deserve and get the unique and tailored care that they also deserve. So to conclude, our recommended solution of the Canada Health Transfer and the age well insurance plan meet our objectives of improving patient outcomes through stabilization and transformation. And it is a system that is sustainably financed that will garner federal and provincial support. This is a system that aligns Canada with its international peers, and it allows our seniors to age with the dignity that they deserve. Now is Ontario's opportunity to spearhead national change to create a modern long-term care system of which we can all be proud. Thank you all very much for your time, and we will now open up the floor for any questions. Well, team, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. I uh, turn to my colleagues on the panel to see if they've got some comments or questions. Susie McDonald, starting with you. Thank you very much, team, for this uh, excellent and I think very well thought through presentation that had some real solutions in it. Um, the one, the one I would say, stakeholder group that I think is missing, given the focus on it, is employers. Um, so employers are already complaining to us that a very modest increase in the CPP of just two percent this year is, is too much, um, and we're going to to burden them more. I don't see a calm strategy specific to them in what you have here. Great question, and I definitely understand and see where you're coming from about the um, perspective that the employers will bring to this. Um, in our communications plan, as well as um, through our proposal, we do propose a phased rollout of the AWIP uh, plan, uh, specifically delaying the introduction to 2025 to allow our employers to have time to recover from the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. On top of this, we're really going to garner that public support that we have right now for a drastic change in our long-term care system because COVID-19 has certainly highlighted um, the gaps in our long-term care system. So we're going to continue to garner that public support that we have right now um, because we know that now is really the time to make such a fundamental change where everyone's recognizing um, just the gaps within the long-term care system. So it's mitigated through the delayed implementation as well as um, our communication strategy. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, turn to Renell Wilson for a comment or question. Thanks, colleagues. So I, you know, I'm just thinking about some conversations I've been having um, with colleagues in, in BC and and thinking about sort of uh, Ontario's position as, as we take this to the table with our PT colleagues. Um, you know, BC just, uh, just finally, um, you know, a lot of work to remove their mandatory medical fees. So just wondering our thoughts of um, really uh, that discussion to have with them to, to bring them on board uh, around that additional um, 
additional ask then under the insurance program on, on individuals to, to kind of come back in and participate in this. I just, um, you know, that was, it was a bit of a, that was a big move for them. And so just wondering what our thoughts were to, to try to bring a, our, one of our PT colleagues like BC on board with us. Okay. Great question. I'm happy to take that one as well. Um, so our per, when we were developing our strategy, we really did want to have something that the other provinces and territories would be willing to commit to as well. When we look at um, our provincial strategies at this time, we do see that a, a significant amount of the other provinces, Alberta, British Columbia, Manitoba, Newfoundland, Quebec, are all looking at aging in place strategies. What's really great about the Age Well Insurance Plan is it does promote a diverse um, system of care where we can have um, unique and tailored care for our residents where there is opportunity to age at home um, or move to a long-term care facility if, if needed. Um, so we do expect that the other provinces will be um, interested and willing to participate in this plan specifically because it does create that diverse marketplace that the provinces are pushing towards and the fact that it is sustainable because it is a revenue solution um, really allows their provinces um, to adapt to the, the growing age population, the, the growing age population. Okay, thank you. Uh, Steve Orsini, next question. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, excellent presentation. I just, uh, I especially like the fact that uh, you've identified a revenue source uh, to help to pay for all the public services the public wants. Uh, my question is, when we briefed the Premier, whose campaign against every type of cost or tax increase, um, uh, how to in, how do we convince the premier who will be concerned about Premier Kenny, Premier Mo, Pallister all being opposed to CPP in the past and will be likely opposed to this uh, change, the part one. And then part two, um, the increase to CPP was a generic fund so people could spend it for whatever they need. It could be home care, it could be long-term care, it, it, you know, they may have different circumstances. So does this force people into a stream of spending they may not require? But I want to go spend more time on how do we sell it to our premier and to those other premiers that would likely resist? Perhaps I can take the first question and one of my other colleagues will take the second. Um, but in terms of talking to our premier about this, I understand that he campaigned on a strategy of not increasing taxes. Um, but at the same time, we are in an unprecedented situation and there has been public outcry for national standards. And on top of that, Ontario is facing a $38.5 billion deficit by the end of this year. And so we really have reached a situation in our fiscal capacity where we can, can no longer um, afford to have an unsustainable funding solution for long-term care. On top of that, Ontario has already committed about 1.9 billion annually to long-term care, and that will further have impacts on our deficit in time to come. And so we really believe that we need a revenue solution to be able to solve this issue for the long run and to ensure that it's sustainable. Okay, and you had a second follow-up uh, follow from a colleague, Ismail? Yeah, so uh, that's, that's a very good question. And I would say to that, that uh, definitely our model uh, allows seniors to choose the type of service. So it, it provides them with the flexibility uh, to, to receive the, the type of care that they would require if, if they require care. And uh, the strategy is really geared towards um, promoting a diverse long-term market that is uh, oriented towards prevention. So um, care can start very early and uh, in, in different forms through uh, assistive technologies, uh, home-based uh, support, uh, and obviously subsidizing uh, co-payments and, uh, and uh, increasing admissions to long-term care facilities. So we believe that uh, in the long run, most Canadians will be served uh, by this fund and um, they will receive the type of care that they require that is tailored to their needs. Okay, Ismail, thank you. I'm, I see Andre Forte's hand still up and Janine, you, your hand was up. So I'll come to you after uh, Andre if you want to. So Andre, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, thanks for the presentation, very interesting. I, I have a rude question um, following what Steve asked. What's the point in putting money in another bureaucracy? Uh, wouldn't it be more easier just to ask people to, for more out of pocket contribution if we have a revenue issue? Uh, or just improve the, the actual programs? 
Um, team, what do you think? Ismail or Hongyu? I, I, hi, yes, I can take this question. Yeah. Um, currently, out-of-pocket expenses are approximately around $2,000 a month for the residents, about $1,007 to $2,007. I think the issue here is that if we want to increase out-of-pocket expenses or we want to um, undertake the investments that are necessary, the amount of resources that are needed um, just is not sufficient to rely on general revenues or not sufficient to rely on increasing out-of-pocket expenses because the amount of burden that people will need to take in order to improve the system would I think be insufficient. Um, as, as it stands, I think as we explained earlier, just maintaining current levels of care, income tax levels, um, it will take up 20% of personal income tax. So that's the situation that Ontario is facing in the next uh, 10, 20, 30 years. And so the relevant comparative is not status quo and increasing taxes. The relevant comparative is a situation where uh, budget deficits increase, taxes increase, and, uh, the, and in order to fund the care that is everyone recognizes that we need. Okay, thank you, uh, Hongyu. Uh, Janine, did, um, I don't want to overlook you. No, that's okay. Uh, then in that case, I've got a question to ask. Do I understand correctly that, uh, that in terms of the uh, AWIP, um, you're talking about 1.5% uh, uh, for the Canadians, for individuals, and 1.5% from employers. That would be on the provincial income tax or the federal income tax? You see, so, I mean, like, like, like who's, going to be, who's going to be announcing to Canadians that they've raised the taxes? Is it the feds or the province? So this would be uh, on the province's side uh, because okay. the federal government would be transferring an additional one percentage point. Okay, directly. so so the feds are giving up one point, but the province is increasing the provincial tax by one and a half percent on individuals and one and a half percent on on the employer. So it's really a payroll tax in effect. Okay, okay, um, and uh, I, I guess my other question is. I mean, do you think that, that this is going to appeal to all the provinces who would really rather just have federal money and have the feds go away? So I would say that it would definitely appeal uh, to uh, provinces, especially uh, the smaller ones, because uh, a, a United Fund um, would benefit their seniors more on average um, and, and lead to, to better outcomes. Uh, and the, the really the key point behind the insurance scheme is that it provides sustainable long term funding that can allow provinces to really plan in, uh, in the long run. Uh, the issue has been that uh, all previous uh, agreements and, and the Canada health transfer uh, change over time and are time bound. Um, and this does not allow for the type of infrastructure and uh, quality planning that, that we require to really transform our system. And this is the, one of the key benefits that we believe uh, underlie the insurance. Okay, thank you, Ismail. So let me go to Andre and then Steve. We think we have time for two questions. Andre. Uh, you're, Sorry, you're I just... Uh, there you go. Yes. <laughs> it's okay, go ahead. Now, now you're muted again, Andre. No, it's okay. I just asked a question. Uh, okay, just, okay. Uh, in that case, then Steve. Steve, over to you. Yeah, I want to explore a bit more on, on the uh, outcomes and success. So let's say there is a, a payroll charge levied on both the employer and the employee. Um, how does that improve the, the standards or the quality? How does that actually fix the problem? It gives people more money. Um, but could you just elaborate a bit more uh, how the in additional uh, ca cash transfers in combination with a payroll charge, uh, how does that actually improve outcome? That's a great question. So in order to first establish the insurance plan, we want to set up this pan-Canadian framework um, with conditions for each province, and it would be to really emphasize shared priorities and best practices and really harness the benefits of federalism in order to um, provide, drive better outcomes within each province, but also allow provinces to maintain 
their jurisdiction over care. As you can see in the pan-Canadian framework, we have three key buckets of be it being transparent, consumer oriented and supportive. And we have within those buckets, the conditions which we believe would drive real outcomes within Ontario. Um, and a lot of this, for instance, the condition in the consumer oriented bucket, which is integration of health, the care healthcare system is also built out of like Ontario's history of long-term care in responding to the Gillespie inquiry report, which was released in 2019, where a long-term care nurse killed eight residents through insulin overdoses. And it was found that if she had not um, confessed, we would actually never have found out about these murders. And that really highlights the need for greater integration of a healthcare system to identify toxicity or to also just check up with um, long-term care residents. On the, um, in the other bucket, for instance, um, in being supportive to caregivers, we want to establish an annual pan-Canadian conference, and that will allow um, caregivers to really share best practices across the country. Um, and then also with the um, transparent reporting, we've seen in um, one part of it is ensuring that we have an efficient enforcement model. We've seen in Ontario that currently regulations are inefficient and ineffective. And out of, um, and we have two forms of um, carrying out inspections. The first is where they're warned in advance. And the second is where they have no warning. And it was found in Ontario that only 27 out of the 626 homes in Ontario um, actually had those inspections. Megan, I'm going to have to cut you off. I, I don't mean to be rude, but uh, oh, no we, we, we've Sorry. come to the end of our time. 